The Scottish Government has just published a route map to take Scotland through and out of the COVID crisis. It provides information about how and when we might ease the lockdown restrictions while continuing to suppress the virus. And it provides us with some indication of what our journey to a new normal might look like. The route map is for ease of access high level, but it will be supplemented in the days ahead with detailed advice and information for the public, as well as guidance covering key sectors of our economy, travel and transport. In publishing this route map, we confront a fundamental issue. The lockdown restrictions have been absolutely necessary to mitigate the massive harm caused by the COVID-19 virus. However, the lockdown is creating harms of its own, loneliness and social isolation, deepening inequalities and serious damage to our economy. None of us want it to last any longer than it has to. So today we are setting out the phases in which we will aim to ease lockdown and reduce the impact on all of us, individuals, families, communities and businesses. The steps we will take are by necessity gradual and incremental and they must also be matched with rigorous ongoing monitoring of the virus. There is no completely risk-free way of lifting lockdown, but we must mitigate the risks as much as we can, and we must not at any stage act rashly or recklessly. For all our progress, this virus has not gone away. It continues to pose a significant threat to health, and if we move too quickly or without proper care, it could run out of control again very quickly. And the danger of a second wave later in the year is very real indeed. We mustn't forget any of that. At every stage, though, the biggest single factor in controlling the virus will be how well we all continue to observe public health advice. Continued high compliance with the restrictions that are in place at any time, together with hand washing, cough hygiene and physical distancing, will continue to be essential, as will wearing a face covering where appropriate. And we must understand and accept what a test, trace, isolate system will require of all of us. Each of us will have an ongoing responsibility to protect ourselves and to protect each other. I want to do three things in today's statement. Firstly, give an update on where we are now in our efforts to control the virus. Second, set out the initial ways in which lockdown restrictions are likely to be eased from the end of next week. And finally, discuss possible future steps and the approach we will take in deciding which ones to take and when. But let me stress now that the nature of what we are dealing with means that these proposals cannot be set in stone. We will conduct formal reviews at least every three weeks to assess if and to what extent we can move from one phase to the next, but we will be constantly alive to when we can go faster or indeed whether we have gone too far. It may be that we can't do everything in a particular phase at the same time, a single phase may span more than one review period, some measures may be lifted earlier than planned, and some later. And of course, our plans will change if the data, evidence, or indeed our understanding of the virus changes. We also welcome views on these plans, including, of course, from other parties. In addition, I would encourage members of the public to read the route map at www.gov.scot and let us know your views. This crisis affects all of us, and how we emerge from it safely matters deeply to all of us. In setting out where we are now, I will give an update on the daily statistics before putting the data we now have into a broader context. In doing that, I want to thank, as I always do, our health and care workers for the extraordinary work they are doing in incredibly testing circumstances. As at nine o'clock this morning, there have been 14,856 positive cases confirmed. That is an increase of 105 from yesterday. A total of 1,318 patients are in hospital with COVID-19. 909 of them have been confirmed as having the virus and 409 uh, who are suspected of having COVID. That represents a total decrease of 125 from yesterday, including a decrease of 34 in the number of confirmed cases. A total of 51 people last night were in intensive care with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, and that is a decrease of two since yesterday. Unfortunately, I also have to report that in the past 24 hours, 37 deaths have been registered of patients who had been confirmed through a test as having the virus, and that takes the total number of deaths in Scotland under that measurement to 2,221. 
Uh, these numbers, together with yesterday's figures from National Records of Scotland, spell out very starkly the human cost of this virus. These are not simply statistics, they all represent individuals whose loss is a source of grief to many. And I want to send my deepest condolences to everyone who has lost a loved one to this virus. However, the numbers also make clear, as I indicated yesterday, that our efforts to curb COVID-19 have had an impact. Our mid-range estimate for the number of infectious people in Scotland is now 25,000. However, we expect that number to decrease further. We are now seeing significant and sustained reductions in the number of confirmed COVID patients in hospital. The number of COVID patients in intensive care is now less than a quarter of what it was at its peak. And yesterday's National Records of Scotland data showed that COVID deaths have now fallen for three consecutive weeks. Last week's total was just over half the figure that was reported for the last full week of April. We're also publishing today a paper which sets out the methods we use for calculating the R number, the rate at which the virus is reproducing. We will now publish our up-to-date estimate of the R number each Thursday. Our latest estimate is that the R number remains between 0.7 and 1. In March, it was probably above 4. And it's worth saying that although these figures do indicate real progress, we cannot and must not be complacent. Progress remains fragile and it would be too easy for the virus to run out of control again. The total number of COVID deaths, 351 last week alone, is still far too high. And although we estimate that the R number is below one, the range has not changed this week and there is still uncertainty about just how far below one it is. It may also still be slightly above other parts of the UK. However, we now have some confidence that the R number has been below one for more than three weeks and that there has been a reduction in new cases and in the impact of the virus. In my judgment, therefore, the time is right to move towards a careful relaxation of lockdown restrictions. But as I will say in a moment, we must do so on a timescale that aligns with our development of test, trace and isolate. Today's route map explains the framework we are using for that relaxation and it sets out future steps people can expect to see and in what order. It is based firmly on the criteria set by the World Health Organization and it takes account of the experiences of other countries. A key aspect of our strategy as recommended by the WHO is the test, trace, isolate, support approach, which will operate in Scotland as test and protect. We will test anyone who has symptoms consistent with COVID-19 and ask them to isolate. We will use contact tracing to identify the close contacts of positive cases. We will ask those close contacts to self-isolate so that if they do develop the disease, there is less risk that they will pass it on to others. And we will make sure that support is available to those who need it. We will also carry out ongoing surveillance and furnish the public with up-to-date information about transmission rates and significant clusters. That system of test and protect run by NHS Scotland is already being used on a case-by-case -case basis. From the end of this month, it will be available on an expanded basis in every health board across the country. That timescale gives us added confidence that we can take the first careful steps on our journey out of lockdown from next week. Test and Protect will be a crucial tool in controlling this virus. However, it will be most effective if we continue to suppress the virus so that the number of infections reduces further. And that is why our emergence from lockdown must be gradual and phased. Today's route map outlines four phases in emerging from the COVID crisis beyond the current lockdown phase. And it covers nine key aspects of our lives, seeing friends and family, travel and getting around, education and childcare, work, business and the economy, shopping and leisure, sport and culture, public gatherings and special occasions, communities and public services, and health and social care. We are legally required to review the lockdown restrictions every three weeks. The next review date is next Thursday at the 28th of May. Providing that we continue to make progress in tackling COVID over the next week, and in particular, see no regression in our progress so far, I can confirm that the government intends to move from lockdown to phase one, and thereby lift some restrictions from the 28th of May. As we enter later phases, as and when the evidence allows, more restrictions will be removed. Details of the relevant criteria to be met and restrictions to be eased in each phase are set out in the document. 
I'm sure that everyone watching will want to know what changes will be made as we move to phase one. But first, a word of caution. Not every phase one measure will necessarily be introduced immediately on the 28th of May. Some may be introduced a few days after that. And depending on the evidence, it is possible that some may have to be postponed, though I very much hope that won't be the case. But next week, when we have completed our formal review, we will make clear exactly what changes we are making and when, and ensure that detailed information is available for the public. However, let me set out now some of the likely changes in phase one. More outdoor activity will be permitted. You will be able to sit or sunbathe in parks and open areas, and you will be able to meet people from one other household, although initially in small numbers, while you are outside. This is a change that we hope will benefit everyone, but particularly those without gardens and people who live on their own. It is important to stress, though, that different households should remain two metres apart from each other. That is critical in ensuring that this change doesn't provide the virus with easy routes of transmission. And because of the much higher risk of indoor transmission, visiting inside each other's houses will not be permitted in phase one. Some non-contact outdoor leisure activities will be allowed to restart, such as golf, tennis, bowls and fishing, subject, of course, to appropriate hygiene and physical distancing. In addition, people will be able to travel, prefer preferably by walking or cycling, to a location near their local community for recreation, although we are asking people where possible to stay within or close to their own local area. Waste and recycling services will resume, as will many outdoor businesses, such as agriculture and forestry. The construction industry will be able to carefully implement steps one and two of its six-step restart plan, which it has developed with us. However, let me be clear that there must be genuine partnership with trade unions. This can only be done if it is done safely. Other industries that are expected to resume in phase two will be permitted in the first phase to prepare workplaces for the safe return of workers and customers. We will no longer discourage takeaway and drive through food outlets from reopening as long as they apply safe physical distancing. Outdoor retail outlets such as garden centres will be allowed to reopen. However, non-essential indoor shops and indoor cafes, restaurants and pubs must remain closed in this first phase. Some key community support services will resume. For example, face-to-face -face children's hearings will restart using physical distancing and people at risk will have more contact with social work and support services. We are also planning a phase resumption of aspects of the criminal justice system. And we will carefully and gradually resume NHS services which were paused as a result of this crisis. I also want to remind people that as of now, you should contact your GP, NHS 24 or 999 if you need to. That message is really important. These phase one measures, most of which have an outdoor focus, are not in place yet, let me stress that, and they are dependent on us continuing to suppress the virus. They will also be monitored carefully as they do take effect. However, we view them as a proportionate and suitably cautious set of first steps. And I hope that they will bring some improvement to people's well-being and quality of life, start to get our economy moving again, and start to steer us safely towards a new normality. It is important to stress, though, that while the permitted reasons to be out of your house will increase, the default message during phase one will remain stay at home as much as possible. As we move into subsequent phases, more restrictions will be removed. Details of these later phases and the criteria we will need to meet are set out in the document. We will make decisions on when and to what extent we can move to these phases carefully and on the basis of evidence, and we will carry out formal reviews at least every three weeks, though I hope we can move more quickly than that if the evidence allows. Presiding officer, I want to take a moment uh, now to talk directly uh, to people who are currently shielding. Uh, those we have asked to isolate completely for 12 weeks because we know they are at the greatest risk from this virus. We know that the isolation imposed by shielding over a long period of time is in itself very difficult and indeed harmful. And so although we are not changing our advice on shielding yet, I can confirm that we will issue new guidance before the initial period of shielding ends on the 18th of June. This will aim to increase your quality of life 
and your ability to make informed choices while continuing to protect you as much as possible from the risks the virus poses. I really understand how hard this is for all of you who are shielding, but I want you to know at this point that you are central to our thinking as we move forward through and out of this crisis. Uh, presiding officer, more generally, the route map sets out what phases two, three and four will mean for different areas of activity. It tries to give as definite as possible a sense of when and on what basis we might be able to see friends and family on something like a normal basis. Uh, we also set out what the different phases will mean for transport and I can confirm that we will publish a much more detailed transport transition plan on Tuesday next week. We also outline the further stages in which businesses might reopen. Uh, let me stress that we want to move through these stages as quickly as the evidence allows. Getting the economy moving again really matters to all of us and therefore we have sought to focus first on industries where people simply cannot work from home. However, safety and the confidence of employers, employees and customers is essential and that is why detailed guidance for key sectors of the economy will follow in the days ahead. Let me stress that we will continue to require uh, for the foreseeable future home working where that is possible and we will also encourage flexible working, including consideration of four-day weeks, for example. Uh, we indicate the phases in which service industries might reopen. That is businesses such as restaurants, bars and hairdressers, the latter being a priority, I know, for almost every woman in the country, uh, and some men. Uh, for restaurants and bars... <laughs> I think I'll uh, not go any further there, presiding officer. For restaurants and bars, opening of outdoor spaces uh, will come earlier than opening of indoor spaces. The route map also indicates when places of worship might reopen. And it makes clear that while our current guidance on funerals, one of the most distressing and heartbreaking rules of the current lockdown remains unfortunately unchanged for now, we do hope to relax it as we move from phase one into phase two. Finally, Presiding Officer, I know that a key priority for parents, children and young people is education and early year services. I can confirm that we are planning to allow universities and colleges to have a phased return next term with a combination of remote learning and some limited on-campus learning. On schools and early learning and childcare, we have published today the report of the Education Recovery Group, which is chaired by the Deputy First Minister and includes representatives of councils, parent and teacher organisations and trade unions. Through this approach, we have reached an agreed position that will help us build confidence amongst pupils, parents and teachers about a safe return to formal schooling. The report can be read in full on the Scottish Government website. I stress that all of its conclusions are subject to health advice and to appropriate measures on physical distancing, testing and provision of protective equipment where required being in place. But let me summarise uh, now the key points. Teachers and other school staff will return during June to prepare classrooms for the new term and a different model of learning. During June and over the summer, an increased number of children will have access to critical childcare, such as has been provided for the children of key workers during lockdown. And we will provide, uh, where possible, transition support for children going into primary one or children moving from primary seven to secondary school. From the 11th of August, all schools will reopen. However, to allow appropriate physical distancing, children will return to a blended model of part-time in school and part-time at home learning. Childminders can reopen during phase one and over the summer, all early years childcare providers will reopen subject to necessary health measures. Capacity will be prioritized for children of key workers, early learning and childcare entitlement and children in need. And the care inspector will provide further guidance in due course. Now, these arrangements will not represent a complete return to normality by August but we judge them to be the most sensible and safe approach we can plan for at this stage. To reflect the fact that children will still be doing part of their learning at home, we are also going to invest a further £30 million to provide laptops for disadvantaged children and young people to enable them to study online. Presiding officer, I want at this stage to take a moment to say a huge thank you to parents, carers and teachers who are doing so much to ensure that children continue to learn during this lockdown period. And I want to send a special message to children and young people themselves 
uh, on the off chance that any of you are watching a parliamentary statement. I know how difficult it has been for you not to be at school uh, and with your friends, but you have been truly magnificent during this lockdown period. And from the bottom of my heart, thank you to each and every single one of you. <laughs> Presiding officer, to conclude, um, as I have briefly summarised, and I know all members will take uh, time to study the document in full, uh, this route map tries to sketch out with as much detail as we can provide at this stage how and in what stages we might move back to some normality as we continue to live with this virus as we are going to have to do uh, for quite some time to come. It doesn't yet set definite dates for all phases because uh, it cannot do so. We know that this virus is and will remain unpredictable. And of course, to a great extent, the timing of these changes, the timing of moving from one phase to another will depend on all of us. It will depend on our continued ability to suppress the virus even as we move out of lockdown. Our emergence from lockdown will be faster or slower depending on the continued success that we have in suppressing the virus. It's also worth saying, I think, that in the weeks ahead, our messages will inevitably have to become more nuanced and more complex as we try to strike a very difficult balance between protecting public health and also allowing more personal choice. Straightforward, strict rules will gradually be replaced by the need for all of us to exercise judgment and responsibility. However, some key advice, for example, on isolating if you have symptoms of COVID, strict physical distancing, washing your hands and face coverings will remain the same throughout. We must continue, all of us, to recognise that every single decision we take as individuals has an impact on others and on our collective well-being. That sense of collective responsibility has been so appreciated by me and I know by all of us throughout this whole period. Indeed, it is only because people across the country have so overwhelmingly observed the lockdown restrictions that we are now in a position of being able to plan ahead. It will be absolutely vital for all of us to continue to abide by whatever rules are in place at any particular stage. And for the moment, until the 28th of May, I must therefore stress that our key public health guidance, as of now, remains unchanged. Please stay at home except for essential purposes, which right now include exercise, uh, going to essential work that cannot be done at home, uh, or shopping for essential items like food and medicine. You can now exercise more than once a day, but when you do leave the house, please stay more than two metres away from other people. And for now, don't meet up with households other than your own. Please wear a face covering if you're in a shop or in public transport and remember to wash your hands thoroughly and regularly. Finally, if you or someone else in your household has symptoms of COVID-19, please stay at home completely. Those symptoms, uh, as a reminder, are a high temperature, a persistent cough or a change or loss of smell or taste. I'm very aware that talk of emerging from lockdown, as well as the nice weather we've enjoyed in recent days, makes these restrictions even harder. But I want to stress that abiding by them is what makes it possible for us to think about relaxing them. By doing the right thing and continuing to do the right thing, all of us has helped to slow the spread of this virus. We've helped to protect our NHS from being overwhelmed. And despite uh, the grim uh, numbers of people dying, we have helped to save lives. And as a result of all of that personal sacrifice uh, on the part of everybody, sacrifice for the common good, we are now able gradually, cautiously and in phases to plan our move back to some normality. So I want to end, Presiding Officer, by thanking everyone for making this prospect possible. Thank you very much. We'll move to questions now. The first question from Jackson Carlo. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. It's now two months since we went into lockdown, and in that time we've seen the best of our NHS, our public services and our communities. There's no doubt, though, that this has been hard and heartbreaking. People haven't seen friends and families for weeks, our most vulnerable and our elderly are isolated, Scotland's businesses are still just trying to survive. And of course our priority remains to save lives and not to become complacent. However, people are now reaching for a way forward. Scotland is already on the move. So a plan to exit lockdown is welcome, even one which promotes a sense of deja vu. 
and I thank the First Minister in advance for sight of her statement. But it raises many questions on how any plan will work in practice. As Scotland is gradually released from lockdown, government communications must evolve from being simple and direct instructions to a broader, and as the First Minister has said, a more nuanced schedule of advice. So in these circumstances, the need for clarity will be more urgent than ever. Can the First Minister confirm that the Scottish Government will publish specific advice for each sector so that there is not any confusion or that confusion is kept to a minimum as we move through each stage? First Minister. Uh, well, can I thank uh, Jackson Carlow for his question? Um, going into lockdown was really difficult for Scotland as it was for all countries. I have always thought that in some ways uh, coming out of lockdown will actually be even more difficult because it will uh, involve us giving more nuanced messages and people having to understand uh, what to do and not to do and also uh, on an ongoing basis even as we might get the impression that the threat of the virus is receding uh, to continue to think very carefully about our personal responsibility and the actions we take. Inevitably, when you put forward a plan, some will say uh, we're going too slowly, others will say we're going too quickly, just as some people say we should have gone into lockdown earlier, and some people, not very many, I don't think, will say there was no point in doing it at all. For me, this is not and never will be uh, a popularity contest. Uh, every single choice I and the government faces right now is a hard choice. Um, and we have to get that balance right. As we try to mitigate harm in one area, we open the risk of doing harm in another area. And that is a very difficult balance to strike, but we must try to continue to do it on an ongoing basis. And the commitment I gave at the start, and as a commitment I will give each and every day we are dealing with this, is I will try to take the best decisions I possibly can at every step based on the best possible information and with the protection of health and human life very much uh, as my guiding principle. Uh, clarity uh, will be important. I said in my statement we will issue uh, guidance in the coming days, both for the public uh, but also for businesses. We've uh, issued uh, a paper today on, on schools, which uh, people are able to read, uh, and we will continue to make sure that that guidance is there. I've uh, said previously that we have 14 uh, sectoral work streams uh, looking at guidance for each uh, key sector of our economy, and we will publish guidance in all of these areas. We've been working uh, with key sectors. I mentioned today the work we've been doing uh, that Kevin Stewart's been very involved in with the construction sector, and we're giving the green light to the first phases of the industry's own uh, restart plan, subject to continued uh, dialogue with trade unions. Um, and we will seek to give that clarity at each and every single step, and I will continue to do everything in my power and to the best of my ability to communicate the clearest possible messages to the public so that we all know our responsibilities and we can all uh, make a collective decision to continue to do the right things because this threat has not gone away and it will not go away in the near future. And as we come out of this phase, uh, government has to be very focused on trying to mitigate the dangers that lie ahead and we will continue to do that uh, as far as possible and for as long as required. Jackson Carlin. Um, as work resumes, employers need time to prepare. Businesses need to know when they can open so that they are ready when that time comes. Now, I welcome the conversations that have taken place with the TUC uh, and the many references that have been made in statements to them. And I also am encouraged by what the First Minister has just reported in relation to discussions taking place with the construction industry. But many wider employer organisations claim that they've not been consulted or involved in discussions with the government on these future arrangements. Can the First Minister give an assurance or is she able to report on those conversations and confirm that they will be an integral part of any return to work strategy? First Minister. Well, we have weekly uh, discussions with all of the key business organisations and that will continue. If Jackson Carlow wants to give me details of organisations that uh, haven't had those conversations, I'd be very uh, interested to, to hear that and, of course, take steps to rectify that. But the key business organisations are included and will continue to be included in these discussions, as is the STUC, uh, which is a, a really critical partner to us as we not just uh, satisfy ourselves that workplaces are safe to return to, but that we are in a position to satisfy workers that workplaces are safe to return to, just as we've got to satisfy parents and pupils that schools are safe to return to. And that is an important part of building uh, the confidence that we must build. build. So I will give an assurance that we will continue uh, with these discussions on an ongoing basis. On the issue of preparation, uh, I appreciate members have not yet had time to absorb the detail 
of the document and route map uh, fully, but uh, you will see when you look at the phases that we are building in time for preparation. So construction is being asked uh, or permitted to start its phased approach right now. That is about preparation. Um, and of course, businesses that will reopen uh, in the next phase, all being well, are able to start making those preparations now. So dialogue and preparation will continue to be vital. Jackson Carver. Uh, thank you. Everyone is understandably keen for normal life to resume, uh, but the real risk of a phased lockdown is that its many variations is that it becomes overly complicated and impossible for people to understand what is or isn't appropriate or indeed permissible. So can I ask the First Minister, what role does she expect Police Scotland to perform at each stage of the exit from lockdown? Or will much of the auditing of business practice fall on local authorities and what assessment has been made of their capacity and resource to manage this, if that is so? First Minister. Well, both Police Scotland and local authorities are a central part of our planning and our discussions. Uh, both take part in the Scottish Government's uh, regular uh, resilience uh, meetings, and, and rightly so, and, and both make a, a very valuable contribution. Uh, Police Scotland will continue to have a role as we go through these phases, but as we go through these phases, uh, we will uh, inevitably move uh, from uh, having rules in regulations to having more of what we're asking the public to do in guidance. That uh, balance is already there, but that balance will change as we go through the, the weeks um, to come. And, and therefore, uh, there may be less of what we're asking people to do uh, that is legally enforceable by the police, but it is important that while there are regulations that are enforceable, the police continue to have an input in advising us on uh, the enforceability of everything we do, and, and they do and will continue to do that, but that the public understands what they are uh, legally required to do and what it is we are asking them to exercise judgment on. And local authorities, both with businesses and with individuals, have a key part to play in all of this. Just to take one example, uh, we have uh, been uh, working with local authorities in the last couple of weeks about the uh, reopening of waste and recycling centres, and there will be many other examples uh, where that applies as well. My final point, President Officer, is about risk. Uh, there's no risk-free uh, path ahead of us right now. Uh, everything we do uh, and everything we don't do comes with risks. My job uh, as leader of the government, but it's the job of the whole government and it's the job of the whole society right now, is to find the best balance of mitigating these risks, getting back to normal, uh, but without allowing the virus uh, to run riot again, because that will cost more lives and that's not, uh, that is not a risk that I'm prepared to take. And Jackson Carr. Like, I ask that question because employees will, know what, will want to know what to do if they do feel that a place of employment uh, is unsafe and have a clear understanding of what their recourse should be. Presiding officer, there is a real risk that without a proper testing and tracing plan, we will not get ahead of the virus and a return to lockdown will then be the consequence. Now, I don't think the First Minister has yet secured that plan as things stand for testing and tracing. We heard this week that the recruitment of contact tracers to achieve the target of 2,000 which the First Minister confirmed to this chamber a fortnight ago, by June the 1st, is lagging behind. We know that even now, actual testing is running at around half of available capacity. So does the First Minister accept that for Parliament and the public to have confidence, and for Scotland to feel safe as we come out of lockdown, it's essential that the infrastructure for testing and tracing, or test and protect, is in place? First Before I go on to test and protect, um, let me just finish off on the point about uh, safe workplaces and uh, making sure that workers have confidence that workplaces are safe. Police Scotland has been mentioned, but it's also worth mentioning that we uh, will continue to work with the health and safety executive and regulators where necessary to provide that assurance. Um, the reason why I have been uh, cautious and continue to be cautious and will not move into phase one until the end of next week at the earliest is because I want to align our lifting of lockdown measures with our ability to implement a, a substantial significant test and protect uh, operation and we will be able to do that from the end of next week in every health board area in the country. These plans are not lagging behind, they are moving at pace. What the health secretary confirmed at the weekend is that health boards have already identified 600 individuals that are ready to do this already and we will have a capacity of 2,000 in place uh, by the end of this month. Uh, we have the testing capacity that we need to do that. I uh, appreciate that testing in every phase is important but it is I think important not to uh, look at the reasons why and the demand for and the purposes of testing now um, and equate that to 
the demand on testing in test and protect. They are uh, obviously trying to fulfil the same purpose, but they are different phases. Um, and these plans are in place. They will inevitably continue to bed down and develop, and they will also have to be flexible because the numbers of tests you will need, uh, the numbers of contact tracers you need, will depend on the, the prevalence of the virus at any one time. So we need to keep it suppressed as possible, but at times where we may see a, a resurgence, even in local areas, have the ability to uh, adapt that capacity to cope. But it is an absolutely crucial part of what we're doing, but it must sit uh, as part of an overall approach that involves all of us physical distancing and following all of the other relevant advice. Thank you, Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and can I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. And let me begin by restating that Labour want the government to succeed in defeating this virus. We want to support the government to get this right. So we have supported the lockdown, and today we support a gradual easing of those restrictions. However, this needs to be done as safely as possible. It needs to follow the science, and it needs to be done at the right time, because we need a national consensus to build public confidence in this plan. So any decisions to ease restrictions must respond to the facts on the ground. And to achieve this, we need three guarantees. First, the government should publish the evidence behind the decisions it has taken and it will take in the future. Second, we need to see maximum testing capacity and a test, trace and isolate system that is fully working and universally rolled out. And thirdly, the government's strategy must be flexible and able to adapt quickly to changing circumstances. Can the First Minister give us these guarantees? First Minister. Um, yes, I, I think I, I can um, in broad terms, and obviously the detail of that we will uh, be scrutinised on and, and will develop uh, in the weeks to come. Can I say firstly that I, I do agree that safety um, and uh, an, an approach that is informed by the best science is absolutely vital, and that's what we tried to prioritise all along. It is also the case that we have and we will continue to try to build a national consensus. If you look in particular at the work the Deputy First Minister has led on getting to the position we have set out today on schools, it has very much had that uh, consensus approach at its heart. And we now, uh, and we don't take this for granted because there's a lot of detail to be worked through, we now have all of the key stakeholders broadly in agreement about the, the, the direction of travel and the, the timing of that. And I think that approach is one we want to take to every single aspect of this. In terms of the three um, asks, uh, on the evidence, I, we, I've said earlier on, we, 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 publish, we publish all the data, we publish data on a daily basis. Uh, we will publish a paper this afternoon that goes into more detail about how we calculate the R number and uh, the, the different considerations there. Uh, the advisory group that is one route of the advice to us publishes its minutes on the website. We will always look at how uh, we can be uh, more transparent around the data, the evidence and the advice that is informing our decision making. But ultimately, decisions have to be taken. Uh, the advisors advise us, we pay close attention to the science, but we, uh, me in particular, and the whole government have to make the judgments based on that and make the decisions. And therefore, ultimately, uh, we are accountable for that. Um, test trace and isolate, I won't go over all the detail I covered with Jackson Carlaw. The reason why I, not the only reason, but one of the reasons I have uh, not wanted to accelerate uh, the, the speed with which we move out of lockdown and taken a slower pace and a more gradual pace as I want to be able to align these steps with test, trace and isolate and we will continue to do that. So the rollout to 14 health boards will coincide with going into phase one um, and then the, the further bedding down of that, developing it, making sure we've got all of the ways in which uh, that works right will align with further phases and it's really important that that relationship is, is there and is tested. And thirdly, we have to be flexible. Uh, there is absolutely no alternative to having a plan here that can be flexible and adapt. I cannot stand here and rule out to the people of Scotland that at some point over the next few months we might have to go back the way because this virus is unpredictable. Uh, we talk about defeating it, but until we've got a vaccine or an effective treatment, I, I think defeat is the, the wrong word to use. Contain, 
live with, suppress. That is what we are trying to do right now and using every tool at our disposal to do that. And we must be prepared to be flexible because we know it is flexible and it will take every opportunity to try to spread further. Uh, so flexibility will be at the heart of everything we do. Richard Leonard. Uh, can I thank the First Minister for that answer? It's clear to my party that we need a plan for the economy. And that starts with a plan for a return to work on a sector by sector basis, which is strategic, which is thought through, and which is above all safe, rather than an arbitrary, if you can't work from home, go out to work message. As the Scottish TUC has said, uh, that would be nothing less than dangerous. So we broadly welcome the government's approach today, but the route map cannot end there, because the truth is, we are facing a massive rise in unemployment, the potential collapse of our town centres, our nighttime economies going bust, and because young workers are two and a half times more likely to work in shutdown sectors like hospitality, like hotels, and like non-food retail, we are facing the return of youth unemployment at levels not witnessed for decades. And so for many, there is an uneasy feeling which persists with looming worries about not just present, but future job losses. So will the First Minister work with us and other parties and work with trade unions and employers in establishing a new industrial strategy, a new plan for the economy, and a new plan for jobs, including a job guarantee scheme, which targets the under 25s, so that we do not see the return of mass unemployment especially mass unemployment among young people. First Minister. Um, look, I, I broadly agree with Richard Leonard's uh, questions and certainly the sentiments behind them. Um, we have a duty to steer the country uh, safely from where we are right now into uh, a position where the economy is operating again. But none of it, certainly not me, are under any illusions about the damage that has been done by the, the lockdown restrictions, essential though they were, to the economy and the action and uh, the, the efforts that will be needed to repair that. So we will, as we come out, uh, come through these phases, uh, we will also be working hard to look at how we uh, do that. I think Richard Leonard is right to talk about uh, the, the risk of unemployment, particularly for certain groups, young people, women, as we uh, spoke about in here yesterday. I spoke about this uh, the other day uh, briefly when we announced some additional funding to try to support young people in particular back into uh, work when we, we come through this. So these will all be uh, really uh, pressing challenges, difficult challenges, uh, but vital challenges. And I give a commitment, we already are working with the STUC and trade unions, we will continue to do so, and we will seek to work with parties across the chamber. Um, it's going to be really important that as we, as we repair this damage, and, and this will be uh, one of the things for all of us that will be easier to say than to do, and we've got to remind ourselves of this, that while uh, we want to repair things and get things back to normal, uh, we, we've got to also uh, take care not to simply slip back into old and, and bad ways of doing things. There are opportunities for change here, um, and I think all of us want to, to try to grasp that. We are going to, people, the, what I've just announced on schools will, for potentially a considerable period of time, give parents very difficult balancing acts between the need to work and the, the need to care for, for children when children are at home rather than in school. That is one reason, not the only reason, why we have to look at different working patterns. You know, things like a four-day week now are no longer things that we should just be talking about. These are things we should be encouraging uh, employers to look at embracing. And there are a whole range of things uh, that fall into that category. So the presiding officer is about to get uh, justifiably irritated at the length I'm uh, taking here. But in short, I think Richard Le Ren Leonard is right about this. We will not agree on everything, but I hope we do find the space to try to work together and find the consensus on as much of this as possible. Richard Leonard. Uh, thank you. Yeah, I think people have seen the glimpse of a different kind of future, and I think there is demand for change. But let me turn finally uh, to the crisis in our care homes, because the crisis in our care homes, the unnecessary death in our care homes, and the anxiety and fear of staff in our care homes, these have not gone away. And as lockdown measures are eased, there is a real risk that they will increase and intensify again. The government was too slow to take responsibility for care home residents for the first two months of this crisis. Now as lockdown is lifted, they must be a priority. This is about the protection of their physical health through testing and PPE, 
but it is also about their mental and emotional well-being too. Because we know this will have been damaged by months of fear, of isolation, and not least separation from their families. So as the rest of the country gradually returns to some kind of normality, how will the government ensure that the rights, the well-being, the dignity of our care home residents is respected and upheld? First Minister. Uh, nothing matters more to me than making sure we protect uh, the health, the dignity, the rights of, of everybody in society, but particularly those who are most vulnerable. Um, and that undoubtedly includes care home residents. And we will continue each and every step of the way to take the actions that we think are right and necessary to provide as much protection as it is possible to do. Um, every single one of us who has uh, been in a position of taking decisions to deal with this crisis will have made uh, mistakes. I have no doubt about that. That's in the nature of dealing with an unprecedented situation and in dealing with it without the hindsight that many are now trying to apply. And, and certainly the responsibility of, of dealing with this will, will bear heavily on me for, for probably the rest of my life. And I'm sure many people in my position will feel the same. Um, but what I, I, I want to make clear here is that at every stage, based on the best information and knowledge we have, we try to do the right things. I think care homes in particular, there will undoubtedly be very legitimate and hard questions for us all to reflect on. That is how we learn. But some of what says, if people say now, it fails to take account of the situation we were dealing with. I, I hear people say now that care home residents should not have been discharged from hospital. Um, and yet, back then, we were waiting for a tsunami, potentially, of coronavirus cases going into our hospital. Uh, if we had uh, not tried to get people who were not medically requiring to be in hospital out of there, that would also have exposed people to very significant risks. I hear from a sedentary position people saying testing. Again, I think that is legitimate. But again, it forgets that back then, our knowledge of uh, the, the efficacy of testing in asymptomatic people is different to what it is right now. The point I'm making here is not that there are not legitimate questions here. They are, and, and I ask myself those questions every single day. The point I am making is that every step of the way we have acted with care and thought and with the best intentions to, to provide the best protection for everybody, including the most vulnerable. And that is what we will continue to do at each and every step of the way. Thank you. Alison Johnson. Thank you. I thank the First Minister for advance sight of her statement. I welcome today's route map, which provides clarity on how we can suppress the virus and lift restrictions, in contrast to the reckless approach taken by the UK government, who have eased restrictions in England without a robust test, trace and isolate strategy in place, contradicting WHO guidelines. Now, I, of course, fully support continuing to follow the scientific advice and staying in lockdown for another week. But does the First Minister agree, particularly given the scenes in Portobello, in my own city of Edinburgh yesterday, that the lockdown is getting harder to sustain and that if we had been using testing capacity to its full potential throughout the pandemic, we'd be better informed about the virus, we'd have been better able to protect people and we'd be able to move to the test, trace and isolate strategy at a faster pace than we have. Thank you. First Minister. Um, on, on the first part of Alison Johnson's question, I, I'm going to continue to do what I've tried to do um, throughout this, and that is resist uh, all and any provocation to be party political about this, um, because I don't think it is appropriate in these circumstances. All of us are trying to do the best we can. Uh, along the way, we will come to different decisions, uh, and hopefully we come to those different decisions for the right reasons. And I think every leader... Uh, probably of every government anywhere in the world is try. well, there are maybe some exceptions to that, but uh, trying uh, to do the best that they, they possibly can. Um, and that's what I will continue to do and, and keep politics as far as it is possible completely out of the equation. Um, look, we will for a long time, and again, perfectly legitimately, be debating the issues of testing, of what we did do and didn't do and, and should have done and should not have done. I accept that. But we set out very early on uh, the plans to build testing capacity. We set out, I remember, standing in this chamber at a very early stage, talking about the priorities that we had for testing in this phase, the protecting the, the sickest and 
uh, most vulnerable, uh, making sure that we tested key workers and uh, surveillance and, and monitoring. Um, and we've also set out uh, and will continue to set our, our plans for test, trace and isolate. I think it is really important that that is aligned uh, with the steps that we are taking to ease lockdown and what we have sought to build into the heart of this route map that we published today. Uh, my final point, presiding officer, is uh, an appeal to the public who have been uh, truly magnificent in how they have uh, complied with these restrictions is just to continue to do it for a little bit longer because if we see uh, a regression between now and next week I won't be able to introduce the changes that I've talked about today and I don't want to be in that position when I saw the pictures of uh, Portobello Beach yesterday that I was uh, it almost felt like uh, crying to some extent because I know why people felt the need to do that and I completely sympathize but every time we have people uh, getting together in ways that provide opportunities for this virus, we, we risk the progress we have made together. So I appeal to people to stick with these restrictions for a bit longer so that we can much more quickly work through these phases and get back to the normality all of us so badly crave. Alison Johnson. I thank the First Minister for her response. The Scottish Government has previously said that it would consider adopting a different approach for different parts of the country based on current scientific advice um, and local circumstances. Um, if it became apparent that there were differing levels of infection in different parts of Scotland, would the First Minister, can the First Minister confirm whether she would still consider a differential approach to lifting lockdown and moving through the phases set out in today's strategy in um, close co collaboration, of course, with local government? Thank you. Um, in short, yes, and if memory serves me correctly, uh, that point is explicitly made in the document. So uh, both in, in general terms about the speed at which we move through phases, but also in some particular issues around public transport, for example, we may uh, require different approaches in different areas uh, for for obvious reasons and of course the evidence might lead us in that direction as I've always said we don't rule that out we also though have to balance that with issues of practicality and deliverability and ease of understanding and, and the ability to communicate clear messages so these like so much of what we're dealing with just now involves difficult balancing acts and we will continue to try to strike these as best we can and, and try not to rule anything out that at some stage might be helpful in what we're trying to achieve. Thank you. Willie Rennie. Uh, I appreciate the advanced copy of the statement and for the work that the officials and the ministers have invested to create this plan. It's probably the most difficult stage that we now enter and we will do everything that we can to help steer us through this period just as we have always sought to do. I have some practical questions. Um, phase three on schools starts on the 11th of August and call centres in August too. Will that be the start time for all the other areas as well? In August, will, be, will we be on phase three for getting around, seeing family and friends, sport and leisure, for instance? Phase three states that pubs and restaurants indoors can reopen. Does that mean that they will reopen in August? Um, that's a very valid and, and important question. It gives me the opportunity to clarify here, although some of my clarification will be the, the flexibility and continued uncertainty around some of this decision making but let me be very clear that the the specific mention of august 11 applies to schools it, it doesn't uh, indicate that all of phase three will start on august the 11th uh, because we have to be guided by the evidence and and take the decisions as we go the one thing i would say though and it may be what willie rennie is understandably getting at is that as far as possible and it may not always be possible, we want to align things like kids going back to schools with, uh, or, or parents going back to work as kids go back to school so that we are actually having uh, as much consideration as possible for people's practical ability to live their lives. So we will try to align these things as far as possible, but we cannot give at this stage beyond, and even the August 11th for school, of course, is subject to the evidence allowing that to happen. We cannot give, and I think it would be a mistake to give people definite dates right now apart from when we hope to go into phase one uh, next week but that's why the review period every three weeks at least will be so important so that we we build in as much clarity about that as we go as quickly as we can really really so it could be that we're in phase four for some areas and phase two for others uh, depending on what the evidence indicates is the case i think clarity is going to be really important so i think we are going to have to work very hard to make sure that message gets across. The message this week remains stay at home. 
The First Minister has indicated that in phase one, the message will be stay at home as much as possible. Will that be the message for phase two, three and four, or will we have different overarching messages for each of those phases? And how will that develop? Will we have an opportunity in the Parliament to debate that so we can make sure that we can get it right? And finally, yesterday I asked about restarting non-urgent health care and the operations because a lot of people out there are suffering. I'm pleased to see that in the plan that it does include measures to restart some of that. I'd like it to go faster, but perhaps the First Minister can explain why that's not possible. Minister. Um, so, Willie Rennie is right to say that it is possible, not certain and not inevitable, that we might be in different phases for different things. Um, the, the document is very explicit about that. And in all of this, the, the need for clear uh, public communication is going to be even more important than it was last time round, and we're very, very mindful of that. I, I would welcome a debate in the Parliament about this. Um, it's not for me to decide parliamentary business, but I'd welcome a debate on the document and also how we best pitch those messages going forward. Uh, at the moment, through phase one, the default message is still stay at home. Clearly, we have an expanding list of reasons that people uh, can leave home, uh, but that default message, stay at home as much as possible, is is still important. As we go through the phases, we will keep that under review because it's important that the messages we are giving people have a relationship to the way in which we are asking and expecting people to live their lives. So input from uh, the Parliament to that consideration would be very welcome. Um, and lastly, on uh, healthcare, I want to move faster through every stage of this if we possibly can and probably nowhere more than in resuming health uh, procedures that have been postponed. Uh, we set out here a careful phase way. We have to make sure um, that we are doing things safely, that we are also, as we do, do resume things, that we are not taking our eye off the, the potential need later this year for significant hospital capacity to deal with coronavirus. I am not trying to scare people. I am certainly not trying to depress people. But I, I ha if I have a fear right now, it is that people are starting to think this is over. Um, and hopefully this phase is drawing to a close, but the risk of a second wave of this virus later this year is absolutely real and we cannot take our eye off that. So we need to get these balances right. Balance is a, a word I, I use repeatedly at the moment, uh, but we, we will try to do as much as we can, as early as we can, guided always by the science and these different considerations we have to bear in mind. Thank you very much. We're going to move now to backbench questions. Bruce Crawford to be followed by Liam Kerr. Bruce Crawford. Okay, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister will understand that some people in sectors may be frustrated that we have not gone further at this time in easing the lockdown. However, I believe the vast majority will support this route map as we attempt to save as many lives as possible while navigating Scotland's way out of the grip of COVID-19. Now, First Minister, I might be getting ahead of myself, but I want to look further ahead because we are potentially facing previously unseen levels of debt and poverty. In response, there will be a requirement for a truly historic and massive increase in public expenditure to help boost recovery. So what plans does the Scottish Government have to discuss this matter with the UK Government? Because as we all know, the current fiscal arrangements in the UK leave the devolved governments with very little room for manoeuvre in this regard. First Minister. Um, I think this is a, a really important question that will continue to be important. Um, we have good discussions with the UK government across all aspects of the handling of this crisis. And despite our political disagreements, I, I would uh, say it's been constructive and I, I want that to continue and hope it will continue. Um, many of our discussions have been about the initial uh, responses, including on the, the economy and helping business. But increasingly, uh, of course, we are uh, seeking to discuss uh, how we respond in the longer term. That will include discussions about how this parliament and, and government can be better equipped fiscally to deal with these challenges, which is an area I'm sure every uh, party will want to be involved in. But also making sure that as we come out of the immediate crisis, we take a, a and by we, I mean the UK government, the Scottish government, all of us, we, we can take a very different approach to that uh, pursued after the financial crisis, where we uh, treat the, the debt uh, accumulated through this separately, almost like wartime, uh, and don't see an austerity approach as being the way to deal with that. That would be a disastrous thing to do as it was after the financial crisis. Instead, we must rebuild carefully. We must be prepared to think about doing things differently. I've spoken in the chamber before about 
uh, my growing support for the concept of a universal basic income, uh, how we support people, get the economy uh, growing again, but sustainably, and also get our focus, uh, as it was before this crisis, firmly on the need to move to net zero. And austerity or anything like an austerity approach would be devastating for all of that, and we must resist it with absolutely everything we've got. Liam Kerr to be followed by Ian Gray. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Willie Rennie's first question was Timaeus, because yesterday Aberdeen was rocked by the news that the Double Tree Hilton will immediately close with the loss of old jobs, citing difficult trading conditions, which includes the current crisis but also punitive business rates. Scotland's tourism industry will have noted that at phase two, pubs and restaurants can open outdoor spaces with distancing and hygiene routines, but that will take some time. And as the First Minister made clear, it will be some time before tourism businesses generally reopen to full capacity. So there's a very real risk that many will not survive between now and reopening. So will the First Minister remind the former Hilton employees what support is available? Uh, and also, what support can she offer the sector more generally until these lockdown measures allow full operation? First Minister. Well, I, I think it's really important that the support that is in place for individuals and businesses right now, which we have warmly welcomed and translated into to programmes here in Scotland, continues for as long as it is necessary. That includes the, the job retention scheme. It includes all of the different grant uh, uh, routes that, that can help businesses right now. And we will, over and above that, seek to do as much as we can uh, to support uh, the, the businesses in the sectors that are going to be hit hardest for longest. Uh, but it is also why we want as safely as possible to support those businesses to restart as well. You know, the tourism sector is, the, the importance of that to Scotland is, is very definitely measured in, in pounds, uh, but it is measured in so much more than that. It is so fundamental to our uh, perception of who we are as a country and to our international uh, standing as well. So supporting the tourist sector is going to be really important, but making sure that as we move forward, we have tailored uh, programmes of support to help uh, those that are going to take longer to come out of this is going to be vital. For uh, employees, whether uh, the Hilton in Aberdeen or uh, for any uh, business for employees who are facing a redundancy situation as well as doing everything we possibly can to avert uh, those situations, our PACE initiative will always work uh, with affected employees to try to support them and uh, support them into alternative employment as quickly as possible. Ian Gray to be followed by Shona Robertson. Um, thank you very much. Parents and teachers uh, will be pleased to have a confirmed date when they can expect schools uh, to open, but they need the confidence of seeing and understanding the scientific advice and public health modelling behind uh, such a reopening. The education framework published today does refer to specific modelling and advice, draws conclusions from it, but it doesn't share it. So in the interest of the transparency the First Minister spoke about earlier, will she publish that advice and modelling now? First Minister. Uh, we do publish the data, I've referred to a, a, an additional document that will be published today on how we do the R number. So we're putting as much of that out there as possible. We will look at what further advice that comes from, uh, for example, the expert advisory group we can share as well. But ultimately, we have to make judgments on this based on all of that. And we have to do that in partnership. And I actually think the way uh, that this has been done, again, you know, led by the Deputy First Minister on schools, is a template for how we do this uh, in future to give parents, pupils, teachers, confidence. Uh, and, you know, I think particularly when we're dealing with children, that is so important. There's lots of commentary and narrative right now about whether or not this virus affects children less than it does others. And, you know, we, we don't know for sure that that is true. There's also uh, some, you know, worrying reports, although we should not be overly alarmed yet about the Kawasaki syndrome that is, seems to be affecting some children. We've got to be very cautious here. So what I'd say to, to all members who are uh, saying publish more, I, I would ask, and it's a genuine uh, invitation, look at all the data we're publishing, uh, look at the further information we're going to publish, look at what the expert advisory group puts on, and, and let's work to see if there's more we can uh, helpfully put in the public domain. We're not trying to hide anything here, but as you know, is developing into a key debate right across the UK right now, ultimately these are decisions that we have to make as accountable politicians um, based on the best advice. So I'm genuinely, and I do mean this genuinely, I'm keen to publish as much as, as possible, but uh, understanding that point that it will only ever take us so far, the decisions still have to be made. Shona Robertson to be followed by Liz Smith. The First Minister outlined how a phased return could be achieved in a way that both protects 
uh, people from COVID-19 while ensuring that key justice agencies can function. Can the First Minister take us through how the Scottish Government will seek to balance harms, given we rightly have to strike a balance between the health harms of coronavirus with the social harm that continued lockdown measures could pose? First Minister. Well, this is probably the, the key question um, and key challenge at the heart of everything we do right now. We first set this out in uh, the paper we published a few weeks ago, the, the framework for decision making, uh, where we, we set out very clearly the framework in which we try to take decisions that very much tries to balance all of these harms, because we, we know the harm of the virus. We have seen it day and daily for the last few months, but increasingly we have mounting evidence of the harms of the steps we're taking to combat the virus. And, you know, as I keep saying, there's no, every choice we make right now is a difficult choice that is about when you try to reduce harm in one area, you at least run the risk of it increasing it in another. And there's no perfect answer to this. There's no, unfortunately, there's no magic science that tells you exactly how you, you do this. But we have to, that, that's why for all that we still face a risk from this virus, my judgment is we face mounting risks from what we're doing to deal with it, and that's why we have to take the risk of starting to ease this in a measured and careful way. So that will continue to be, and we'll publish, um, as I think we did at the last review date, some of the assessments of these different harms that are feeding into that decision-making process. Liz Smith, be followed by Claire Baker. Uh, thank you. May I ask the First Minister what guidance and support will be available uh, from the Scottish Government to prevent the closure of several of Scotland's outdoor centres, which, as the First Minister will know only too well, could be so important in fostering the well-being of our young people as they come out of lockdown, especially many in a disadvantaged community. First Minister. Well, I think what we want to try and do is enable as many outdoor activities to restart um, again, uh, both in terms of outdoor activity of individuals, but outdoor leisure activities and outdoor sport, and the, the document goes into some uh, detail of that. Uh, there is a focus in much of the early phase of, of this work on outdoor activity for a, a very important and probably very obvious reason. Although we uh, don't have any definitive answers on any aspect of, of this or many aspects of this virus, the evidence does suggest that the risks of transmission out of doors are lower than indoors. Um, so therefore, we feel more confident in, in lifting that. And I hope that will be uh, positive news for outdoor uh, centres because it, it does offer a route uh, to uh, restarting activity, albeit on a carefully uh, planned basis. And, and we'll continue to support that as much as we can. Claire Baker, to be followed by Keith Brown. Um, thank you, President Officer. Um, during phase three, a blended model of school education is proposed, and this is planned for the 11th of August. Can I ask when parents can be expected to know what their child's school week will look like in terms of how many days they will attend school? And what consideration has been given to school transport needs? Many high schools in my region rely on buses and social distancing is not possible. Will local authorities be funded to provide additional capacity? Minister. On the first part of the question, uh, parents will be communi communicated with directly over the summer so that there is a, an understanding of exactly uh, what the, the, the school provision will be for uh, their child or children um, and actually that is why we again all of this is subject to, to the health advice uh, we are keen and, and teachers are keen to, to get back during June so that they can uh, do the preparatory work that is needed uh, for that um, and we will uh, take care to make sure that is communicated clearly uh, to parents and indeed to, to young people uh, themselves. Um, in terms of transport, which is uh, also a very important issue, I, I think I mentioned that uh, Michael Matheson will set out a transport transition plan uh, next week. Obviously, that will be covering the uh, totality of uh, public travel and, and transport. Uh, but as part of those discussions, uh, how children travel to and from school is, is really important because there will be uh, restrictions on uh, transport given social physical distancing. Uh, we also know some uh, provision of transport has been under pressure because of children not being at school recently. Uh, so more detail on this will be provided. We will be working closely with local authorities on this. And just to give the assurance right now, it is a key part of our thinking as we work out in practice how children do get safely to school. And by safe there, obviously, I mean it in all of its uh, different uh, respects. Keith Brown to be followed by Donald Cameron. Uh, the First Minister highlighted the work that the Education Recovery Group is undertaking regarding proposals to expand the school estate and also the education workforce in preparation for pupils being phased back to school to allow for social distancing and classroom learning to uh, recommence. 
Can the First Minister also confirm, though, that schools will not be opened unless and until it's deemed safe to do so? And in accordance with local circumstances, councils will be best placed as education providers to talk about the physical infrastructure they have. And also that crucially, and unlike what we've seen happen in England, that this will be done in consultation with teachers, parents, trade unions and other stakeholders. Uh, yes, I, I can give all of those assurances. We, we've got to where we are today in consultation with teachers and, and local authorities and, and parents' organisations, and that partnership approach will very much continue. Keith Brown's right to talk about the lead role of local authorities here, particularly when you're talking about the physical infrastructure in schools that will have to be adapted uh, in order to accommodate the, the kind of model that will be uh, necessary. Um, and lastly, um, I, I will absolutely give an assurance uh, that we will only open schools when we think it is safe to do so. Um, because if we were to take any other approach, which we wouldn't do because we shouldn't ever compromise the safety of children, but if we did, we wouldn't persuade parents to send their children back to school. So if we are to get children back to school, the government and local authorities have to do the work that we have to do. Teachers have to make the preparations they have to make, but we have to persuade parents and pupils that it is safe to go. Otherwise, the whole thing uh, will not work. And that is why it is so important to take a careful, cautious, deliberative approach to this. And while we all want children back in school as quickly as possible, if that careful, cautious, deliberative approach means it takes a little bit longer to give people that confidence, then I think that is worthwhile, rather than trying to rush things in a way that doesn't command the confidence that is required. So we will always try to do this in the most careful way possible. Donald Cameron to be followed by Ruth McGuire. Thank you. Following that answer, parents will understand why schools can't open this term, but the idea of blended schooling in the autumn term means that parents look likely to have to balance work and childcare and homeschooling for months, maybe till the end of the year. The education framework published today suggests there were differing views uh, amongst the advisory group about the need for social distancing in schools. That being so, can the First Minister explain the rationale behind the proposed blending of in-school and in-home learning? First Minister. Um, we will continue, our, our knowledge and understanding of all, all of this, not just in this area, but in all of the aspects of handling this virus will undoubtedly develop. Um, but it is really important, all of uh, the advice um, that, that I have access to do, access to talks about uh, and is very strong on the importance of physical distancing. And I think we should really be very clear about that. There are uh, debates about uh, and there are actually different approaches in different countries right now to whether that's two metres or one and a half metres or, or one metre. And no doubt these discussions will continue between scientists and decision makers uh, for, for a time to come. But the, the importance of physical distancing, certainly in my mind, is not in doubt. Now, that creates a whole range of challenges for us in the school environment and in almost every other environment that we are uh, all used to being in. But these are the things we have to work through if we are to get back to some kind of normality without taking uh, unnecessary risks and unacceptable risks with people's health and well-being. Uh, it is the case, and I think people now understand this, but it really is important to continue to stress that we have made huge progress against this virus, but it is still there, and it will resurge again uh, in no time if it finds the bridges between people to, to jump over. And therefore, all of these physical distancing and other measures are going to be so important and they will make life that much more challenging for a significant period of time to come but we have to work through all these challenges as best we can and try to uh, do it in a way that is uh, maximizing the convenience particularly for parents who will be juggling childcare, homeschooling and work for potentially uh, quite some time to come. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Adam Tompkins. Presiding officer, um, we are all affected, but we know that some people are disproportionately affected by the virus and the restrictions in place. With that in mind, can I ask how the Scottish Government ensured that the views and experience of disabled people, carers and BME communities informed the route map and what steps they'll take going forward to ensure that any voices that have been excluded will be heard? First Minister. Well, throughout this, we've tried to be uh, as open and consultative as possible with the population at large, but also, as Ruth McGuire rightly says, with particular groups in the population. Um, we've made very clear from the publication of the Framework for Decision Making through to today's publication that fairness, dignity, equality, uh, human rights are key principles that have to underpin our response at all stages. The harms 
caused by this pandemic are to a greater or lesser extent being felt by everybody, but they are not being felt equally. And therefore, uh, how we respond has to take account of that inequality. So we are, and uh, Christina McKelvey has been leading uh, much of this work for us, engaging regularly with organisations that directly represent the voices of some of the most disadvantaged groups in society. Um, and that includes uh, people with disabilities, and we will continue to ensure uh, that that approach is central to everything we do. Adam Tompkins, to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The First Minister conceded in her statement that lockdown has caused and is continuing to cause a number of serious and potentially long-term health harms from cancer to mental health. So can I ask, will the Scottish Government publish its assessment of the adverse public health impact of lockdown so that we can balance its effect against the undoubted threat of COVID-19 itself. First Minister. Um, perhaps this is a small point. I, I don't think I conceded it. I, I've said this all along. I think everybody uh, has said this all along. We all understand those differing harms and the need to balance them as best we can. Um, and that will be an ongoing challenge, uh, not just for government, but for parliament and, and for society as a whole. And in terms of publication, we, um, if, if memory serves me correctly, which I think it is, we published um, a document at the time of the last review uh, date, uh, what, two weeks ago now, uh, assessing all of these different harms. Uh, and we will do that at every uh, review date. So if Adam Tomkins hasn't seen that, I would suggest he uh, has a look at that. And if there, are, if there are more areas of information he thinks it would be helpful or any member thinks it would be helpful for us to try to include in that, we're happy to try and accommodate that in future iterations. And I saw words be followed by Fulton McGregor. <clears throat> Thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, cancer is Scotland's biggest killer, and Scotland's cancer organisations are warning that we are at risk of an unprecedented cancer crisis. Some cancer services were struggling pre-COVID-19 due to major staff shortages. But one of the causes of COVID-19 have been the pausing, for example, of the screening programme. 2,000 fewer people being referred for early diagnosis. And the sad reality is that many people will die because they weren't diagnosed early enough or aren't able to access the treatment they need uh, now. So I welcome the route map uh, to normality, but can the Scottish Government install immediate measures so we can return Scotland's cancer services as best as possible to normality now so we can help save lives? First uh, yes, we, we are and will continue to do that on an ongoing basis. The uh, route map today sets out, at this stage, an assessment of some of the order in which we will seek to do things, although we will want to accelerate as much as that is possible. Uh, right now, the resumption of uh, screening services is uh, in phase two, but we will be looking uh, continuously at whether that can be brought uh, forward. Uh, the uh, suspension of screening services was in a a sort of panoply of really horrible and difficult decisions over the last three months, probably one of the most difficult. And the judgment that was uh, arrived at, uh, informed by clinical advice, that it, it was less harmful to do that than it was to carry on with people missing appointments because they might have been ill or worried about going uh, to appointments uh, because of the risk of the virus. Because if, if we'd done the, the latter, people would not then have been uh, seen until the three or five year cycle. Whereas if we pause it, we can pick up as we resume again and nobody will miss out completely. So neither of these options were good, but that was the decision for that option. But to get that, uh, get these screening services resumed as quickly as possible is something I want to do. I know it's something the Health Secretary wants to do and we will be seeking to do it absolutely as quickly as possible. And we will continue to talk to cancer organisations as well about how we mitigate the harm uh, in this respect and what other actions we can take in the short term and as quickly as possible to try to, to deal with what are extremely uh, serious issues that none of us, absolutely none of us, are complacent about in any way. Fulton McGregor to be followed by Andy Whiteman. Um, thank you, President Officer. I rise not only as a, an MSP today, but as a dad to two young children. And like many parents, I'm absolutely terrified of what schooling might be like for our children, what impact social distancing could have on their learning and development. And that's why I'm fully supportive of the measured, cautious and evidence-led approach of this government. And I want to thank the First Minister and Deputy First Minister personally for that. First Minister, given the evidence that outdoors is safer eh, than indoors, as you've already said, and being outside and active is beneficial for kids anyway, can I ask what steps the government are thinking about to increase outdoor education as one of a suite of measures to allow schools to reopen safely? First Minister. Uh, before this crisis, we had already uh, been 
doing work to increase the provision of outdoor education. Uh, Marie Todd, in particular, in the early years context, has been uh, a real champion of some of this. And I think we not only have an opportunity now, but have a necessity to, to look at doing that even more uh, within all of the, uh, the constraints of the, the, the Scottish uh, winter weather that we're all uh, familiar with. But I think it is a really important aspect of what we will need to do. Uh, this is going to be a really, really difficult um, conundrum to work our, our way through which is why doing it in partnership is so important none of us none of us want children to be unsafe at school but all of us want to see children back at school and back at school in a way that just allows them to be children none of us relish the prospect of seeing uh, kids particularly young kids having to socially distance or or be as aware of these risks as, as we will undoubtedly have to uh, require them to be so trying to get children in particular as much normality as possible in the school environment is really important uh, we shouldn't underestimate the challenges of that uh, but it is absolutely central to all of this careful planning that is underway andy whiteman to be followed by lee MacArthur. Well, thanks presiding officer the first minister talked about in her statement the need to ex for the public to exercise judgment and responsibilities uh, in the months uh, ahead. Now, given that as species we are instinctively used to handling risks when we travel to work, uh, what we eat, etc., uh, many people are engaged in dangerous activities that involve calculating uh, risks. But this virus is a little bit different, and I'm aware that many people who have been stuck at home, many of them are very, very fearful and overestimate the risks. Uh, some of them are rather more complacent. Uh, what will the government do to ensure that the public is as knowledgeable as possible about the risks that really exist? and importantly, how they themselves can assess them and manage them. First Minister. So I, I think that is arguably one of the most important questions uh, at the heart of uh, the, the, the next phase and the phases we will go through. Um, and like so much of this, there's no easy answer. Uh, but if, if I can take the shielded group briefly before I come on to the more general point, um, that's what we need to try to do. We need to move from a situation where we're asking uh, people to shield themselves completely to think about how society best protects them and allows them to, as far as possible go about their normal life and make informed uh, decisions. Uh, testing will be an important part of that through test and protect. Uh, giving people information about if there, if there is a higher transmission in their particular area or community, making sure they have that information so that they can adapt their own uh, behaviour accordingly will be really important. Um, so these are all uh, really important considerations that we are, are thinking through right now. And, and that is true of, of the general population. Increasingly, it, this will be about uh, equipping people to make uh, decisions about the balance of risk uh, and also making sure people understand uh, that my biggest worry over the next uh, couple of months is that there will be a perception that this virus has gone away. And all of us, and I mean all of us, none of us are going to be immune from this. We just slip back into the, the old ways of doing this, things. And that is going to be really, really important to combat. So information and giving people the tools they need to make the best decisions and reminding everybody that more than ever before in our lifetimes, our individual decisions impact on the collective well-being is going to be really important. So we will try our best to get that right. Government can't do it alone. I think we've all, as uh, elected politicians and elected representatives, I think we're all going to have a big role to play in that uh, in the weeks and months to come. Lee MacArthur to be followed by Kenneth Gibson. Lee MacArthur. Yeah, thank you, President Officer. The First Minister rightly highlighted the importance of transparency as the government takes forward its test uh, tracing isolate strategy. So will she therefore agree uh, to make publicly available details of the testing that's taking place at a local health board level? That localised detail uh, is already available in relation to confirmed COVID cases and COVID-related deaths. Uh, but without knowing how much testing is taking place, however, it's impossible for the public to make sense of the information that's published. Uh, so in the interest of public uh, confidence, Will she agree to publish data on taste testing at a local health board level? First Minister. Yes, I, I will be happy to uh, look at how we, we do that. I, I think it will be important to do that. I, I'm not going to give a, a straightforward commitment because I need to go and discuss the practicalities of that. But I think in principle, yes. What will be most important is making sure that people have under, an understanding if transmission uh, of the virus is higher in their area than it might be elsewhere so that we can, uh, to go back to Andy Whiteman's question, equip people with the ability to know what risks they should be taking and what risks they shouldn't be taking. So transparency around that will be important. So if uh, 
Lee MacArthur is, uh, is okay with this. I'll come back to him uh, with a bit more detail of what information we will provide as part of Test and Protect once we've had a chance to consider that in a bit more depth. Kenneth Gibson to be followed by Miles Briggs. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Presiding Officer. First Minister, given the demographic fragility of Scotland's rural and island population, as the lockdown eases, health must remain the primary consideration. Many holiday homeowners are understandably championing at the bit to visit their properties. However, many of my island constituents fear that unleashing thousands of holiday homeowners and day trippers from mainly urban areas into their communities will undoubtedly carry the risk of local flare-ups of the virus and even potential animosity. There is little support among island residents for lifting visitor restrictions soon. Therefore, what precautions will be taken to protect rural and island communities as the lockdown eases and tourists and second homeowners from across the UK begin to return? First Minister. Well, I, I, again, I think that is where uh, having locally uh, available information will be important. Um, and that really uh, links back both to Andy Whiteman's question and, and Liam MacArthur's question. But fundamentally, I, I suppose my main message right now would be that we are still saying to people not to travel uh, to at rural parts of Scotland, not to travel to uh, holiday homes, not to uh, you know, sort of go to places that are already fragile in terms of infrastructure and, and health services and not to risk uh, taking the virus uh, with you when you go. Uh, we do say in phase one, which we hope will kick in uh, from a week today, that we, we envisage people being able to travel more for recreation and leisure, uh, but we are saying that in this phase, that should continue to be where possible within your own locality. Uh, I think the document says, as a guide, I mean, uh, this is not going to be some prescriptive rule, uh, I should say, but as a guide, we're saying five miles. Obviously, in rural areas, that may be uh, different uh, and mean something different than it would in a, an urban area. So that is a guide. But the general principle of staying within your community and your locality just now is important because we don't want, and I, I'll be very, very clear and specific about this, we do not want, over the next... Uh, uh, phase of this to see uh, tourist spots flooded with uh, people uh, out for day trips because that again this virus just loops all the time for bridges to hop across and the more people are together in crowded places uh, the more chance it has of doing that so it's really important that people stick to the advice we're giving even as that advice evolves as we go through these phases. Miles Briggs, before by Colin Smith. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I wanted to return to Jackson Carlow's point around transparency, because given the events of the last few weeks around the government's handling of the Nike outbreak here in Edinburgh, my own constituents are not filled with confidence. But, so I wanted to turn to a point the Deputy First Minister said on the radio this morning, that the government had recruited 600 people um, out of their target of 2,000 by the end of this month. Can the First Minister confirm how many of these 600 um, in the Isolate team have actually been moved from other coronavirus response departments, such as the, field, uh, the shielding contact group. First Minister. Health boards will be making judgments about what is appropriate as we go through different phases, then tasks that were being done uh, previously will perhaps no longer be necessary in the same way, so people will move. We've given health boards the rightly given health boards the responsibility to look in the first instance at recruiting from within their own resources people who can do this job because uh, many people uh, well people will need training and guidance many people will be experienced in this and you know obviously people need to be have the proper checks uh, and everything in place in addition to that we will recruit and we have uh, a recruitment advert live just now i think the uh, closing date of that is in the next couple of days the 22nd of may um, and there will be recruitment from uh, that pool uh, to augment that so all of this has been done at pace and in the right way making sure that we are using the resources at our disposal in the most sensible way forward thank you colin smith to be followed by john McAlpine. thank you uh, president officer the first minister said that the proposed test and protect system will be available on every scottish health board from the end of the, the month but the first minister knows that, that many of my constituents cross the border every day for work education for health and leisure and those numbers of course are going to rise in the days and the weeks ahead so it's kind of first minister give an assurance that the interaction my constituents may have with someone living in the north of england uh, who tests positive for covid 19 will be picked up by the test and protect system and indeed interactions um, from someone from england and uh, working in the south of scotland will also be picked up and, and will that include the technological solutions aimed at assisting with the process will be compatible on both sides of the border. First Minister. Uh, yes uh, to both of these things although uh, on the latter one in particular there is still uh, work ongoing but 
you know, public health experts are used to dealing with uh, infections that cross borders, and that will be particularly important in the, 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 the geography that uh, the member uh, talks about, that when uh, somebody is, is testing positive on one side of that border, there is contact tracing um, on the other side, and it may be different organisations that do it, but the integration and the collaboration there is really important and is actually well established in dealing with these kind of issues um, already. On, on the technology, um, I, Forgive me, I'm, I'm not uh, an expert on all the fine details of the technology, but as I've explained before, the, the Scottish system of Test and Protect will have its own digital system, uh, both for use of contact tracers and uh, as soon as possible uh, for uh, people to use as a way into the system. And it's important that is integrated with uh, our, our health systems as they are and, and work is ongoing to do all of that just now. In addition to that, we're in discussions with the UK government about the proximity app uh, which we want to be able to use if, if possible. We don't yet know exactly how that's going to be rolled out, but as well as being confident about how that works, one of the issues is to ensure that there is an integration between it and the systems we use here. And I think, um, I may be wrong about this, that will be true for English health trusts uh, as well to make sure that that integration is there. So some of these discussions are ongoing, but uh, I am advised progressing well and will continue to keep members updated. Joan McAlpine to be followed by Tom Mason. Thank you. This is Scottish Learning Disabilities Week. In England, data from the National Learning Disabilities Mortality Review suggested people with learning disabilities had a higher death rate from COVID-19 than those in care homes. Many learning disabled people live together in supported or residential com uh, accommodation and have underlying health conditions and require help with personal care. And I should say my own sister is in this situation. As in care homes, these individuals have had no visitors since the beginning of lockdown, which can be very distressing. And it also means their main risk of catching COVID comes from asymptomatic care workers. Can I ask whether Scotland has comparable figures on deaths among learning disabled people? Also, when will their care workers be able to access the same routine testing as care home workers announced this week? And finally, what consideration will be given to the needs of people with learning disabilities as we move out of lockdown? First Minister. Well, there's some really very important issues uh, contained in that question. And if I don't cover all of the detail of it, uh, I'll ask the Health Secretary to write to Joe McAlpine with, with additional detail afterwards. Um, the, the data uh, that Joe McAlpine talks about is not currently collected on death certificates, but we're working with National Records of Scotland and the Scottish Learning Disability Observatory to ascertain whether uh, the data from death certificates can be linked to census data to give an indication uh, of deaths related to COVID for people with learning disabilities uh, or, or people with autism. Um, all social care and social work staff who are working with vulnerable people in the social care system, including care homes, uh, care at home and children's services, including residential and secure care for children um, and social care personal assistance are in the priority group one for testing and that will uh, continue primarily to be routed through NHS uh, testing at local NHS facilities. Uh, we're working with clinical advisors to develop guidance on minimising the distress of testing for people who may be anxious about being tested um, and we are very conscious of the need to ensure even within these current restrictions uh, appropriate visiting uh, for people. So um, I will, as I said at the outset, uh, ask the Health Secretary to, to write to Joe McAlpine with some additional detail on uh, the key points that she raised in that question. And Tom Mason. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. First Minister, you mentioned a number of non-contact outdoor activities which now can be pursued. This, of course, will be most welcome across Scotland as it's been most frustrating in the past few weeks being locked, in, locked down with the weather as it has been. You mentioned golf, bowls and fishing, among others, I have two questions. Are these specific or are, are there an indicator of sports that can be pursued? As there are a number of other sports, such as croquet, of which I have an interest, which are not mentioned there. And secondly, will the protocol for operation of these sports be subject to regulated, uh, negotiated, regulated, or, or will, will they be self applied? Thank you. So, Mr. Mason, we, we heard the croquet mention. <laughs> we, we, it caused a little bit of a reaction in the chambers. We didn't hear the last part of your question. After croquet, what did you mention? Um, it was, which, which I had an interest, I have an interest in croquet. And secondly, it's whether the, the operation of these sports and activities will be, be subject to regulation, in, in, in negotiated regulation or, or, or self-application as to 
distance in it and, and, and the like. Thank you. First Minister. Um, so, so yes, we will expect uh, the sports, uh, non-contact outdoor sports that are being allowed to recommence to have uh, uh, due regard to social distancing, physical distancing and public hygiene. I mean, one issue that was raised with me, of course, is when you're playing bowls, then the the balls may be picked up by different people, so you have to make sure that, that hygiene is there. Um, that is not something that can be regulated in every single uh, circumstance, but we are asking people to make sure uh, that they take proper steps. In terms of the sports mentioned, they are illustrative, uh, not exhaustive. Um, I'm not sure I'm giving a, an undertaking to specifically add croquet to the published document, um, but I, I'm, I'm open to lobbying on, on that basis. I'm, uh, I'm not sure, although I suspect my inbox this afternoon will tell me how many croquet players there are <laughs> across Scotland, so I better not uh, say anything that could be mistakenly construed as being insulting to croquet players. Um, President Officer, can I, I thank Tom Mason for, for that question, and if there's more detail, I couldn't hear everything he was saying, so if there's detail I've missed there, I'd be happy to deal with it in writing afterwards. I, I don't know if this is the last question, President Officer, but just as a public information, I'm, I'm told by the Deputy First Minister, the website um, has had a, a massive number of visitors to it, understandably, to access this document, more than 100,000, while we have been uh, in uh, the chamber right now. So can I make a plea to the public just to bear with it? If it's a bit slow because of that demand, uh, don't give up. You'll be able to access it later on today. Thank you very much. Thank all members for their participation. I'm going to suspend proceedings until half past two when we'll resume with questions on local government and communities.